And with that, we are back at ITV Convention at the Orange Stage. It's great to have you. Again, thank you so much for joining us virtually online in the live stream, also here on site in Berlin. It's great that you're around. I mean, what other options do you have? right now. <laughs> no, it's amazing to have you here at the Orange Stage, although we are all stuck a little bit. Nevertheless, we are talking here at the Future Track Day all about responsibility, sustainability, transformation and transition. The really bold question is, are we bold enough for these radical changes and are we drastic enough to drive sustainability and responsibility really forward? And for that, I welcome Willy Legrand and his guests. Yeah, it, it does feel like class time, doesn't it? Do you get a credit at the end of this <laughs> three hours I have you here? <laughs> I'd love to give you a credit. Um, this is the end of the day. It's been a day of, of big discoveries and good discussions, but the question is, is this enough, really? Right? Are we drastic enough in all of this after the talk? And this next group here think that we're not, in fact, and they're here to propose some ideas. So I'm really happy that you stick around, actually, uh, to get that feedback, actually, on those ideas. Uh, which maybe some of, some of those ideas may shock you, but we'll see. Um, and with us, so therefore to start, and we, I'd like to welcome the initiator of this group on radical changes in tourism, and that is uh, Professor Stefan Gerhardt, he's an entrepreneur, but also we'll welcome someone who has done a radical change in his life, and that's uh, Mr. Georg Schweisfurt. He's a founder of Ermansdorfer Organic Farms and also a former board member of Greenpeace. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm quite astonished that that many people are still here because we have got two strikes or three or four or something like that. It was the first minute. We haven't got that much time. Okay, so I'm the one who wants to tell you something about the real start of the whole thing, uh, how it all of that began. Why did and why are we standing here? So it started one and a half years ago, and uh, the uh, the German television asked me to be a bad guy in the report about carbon, and the rich people are the bad guys because they uh, need much more carbon and the emission is much higher than with the poor people. And so naturally I said I want, always wanted to be the bad guy in my life, so I said yes, you can, we can make this interview. So we met, uh, which is also something very special, we met in Barcelona on a boat. Everything is not that uh, very good for sustainability, okay? And then uh, uh, he asked me, the journalist asked me, uh, three and a half hours about what do I think uh, about the world of tomorrow? Why do I travel that much? Uh, how can you, uh, how can you dare uh, to do things like you do and uh, to build uh, new hotels and everything like that? So. I tried to argue against it and I said, well, we are doing everything which is needed and which we can do. For example, we are cooking our marmalade ourselves. So he said, this is not radical enough. And so I am his opinion. And then I said, we are working with Sula, we are working with everything. We are buying the things 50 kilometers around the hotels and so on and so on. So all my arguments, three and a half hours, he, every time he said, this is not radical enough. So this is the be very beginning. So I was a sort of deeply. And uh, then I came home and then I thought about it. What could I do to change tourism really radically? And I didn't have an idea, not at all. But I had a friend. So I fr asked this friend, which is Wokart, he's over there. And I asked him, do you want to discuss with me uh, about radical change in tourism? And he said, oh, yes, I would like to, but I have no idea, but I've got a friend. So this friend is Willy. And uh, so we had the first one who had uh, some ideas about sustainability. And so Willy asked then Frauke, and then we asked Georg, 
And then we asked Hisham. And then we asked and we asked. Everybody had a friend. So today we are a group of uh, more than 10 people working on this radical, <laughs> radical uh, challenge. You know, that means we, we are working on uh, the radical change in tourism, which is not that easy, you know. So even I, and I'm sort of entrepreneur, I always had to think, uh, is it radical enough was the first thing. Second thing, is it possible? Can you do it? Or is it only an idea you have got? So then it was very good that he joined us because he's the only man on earth I know who did already a radical change in his life. So nobody else did it, I think, but he really did it. You should you know, look at him. He's the only one. And um, so he changed his life radically uh, in former times. And therefore, it's now up to you maybe to tell us something, how it is possible to do the same thing as before, but change it radically. That's right. That's what we did. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, my name is Georg Schweisfurt. I come from an entrepreneur family, uh, five generations, butchers. Oh, oh, butchers. I'm a trained butcher too. And uh, we uh, made a radical change uh, even 40 years, almost 40 years ago, when uh, my father decided to sell the company, which was a beet business company, Hertha. Maybe some of you might know this, this brand still exists. Uh, and uh, starting from the beginning. Yeah? And this is what I want to show you just as a reminder. This is Hermannsdorfer. It exists since 40 years. And, and we said, okay, uh, we were, you know, we are butchers, but we love the animals. So we had, uh, we had the experience that uh, animals do not live as they could live. So we changed radically the way we treat the animals. Uh, they call it animal compassion, and this is what we do in Hermannsdorf, as well as a butcher shop and cheese-making departments, uh, and chicken, and uh, we have two slaughterhouses there and have stores in, in Munich. The second thing what we do, and why I possibly I, I joined the radical group here, uh, was uh, that we run a hotel very close to that, can uh, I have to do this? Excuse me. Yeah, this is the symbol for uh, you know the freedom uh, for the pigs. We always show this um, um, picture because it shows how we treat the animals and how they live, which is very uh, uncommon. Yeah. And this is the second uh, uh, place where we do organic farming as well, and this is a hotel. And in this hotel, uh, we do uh, seminars as well as uh, uh, parties. We, it's a, a former stud, and we do organic, far organic, farm organic farming. And you can see that uh, all the green land around us uh, serves our kitchens. You know, this is uh, something which is not common uh, as well. So we we have our own gardens, and we do this. Uh, you know, the impact of f food is, um, has the, you know, is extremely high on our earth. That's why my life consists of, you know, uh, uh, make it better, make it a better food for everybody, healthier, healthier for the, for the planet and uh, uh, more tasty. This is what we do. I cannot go into the depths of the thing. Ah, here's, here's another photograph of our hotel. Uh, third thing, and I have 56 seconds left. Uh, third, 54. 54. 54. The Sorry. third thing what I did was <laughs> Very uh, when I left the family companies, yeah, I, I uh, founded the first organic uh, supermarket, uh, which was called uh, Basic uh, Bio for Everybody. Probably you know, and we have that in Munich as well as in Frankfurt and, and, and Hamburg and Berlin. And the point was to uh, lower the, the barrier for uh, the people to buy organic food. And it was a huge, uh, a massive growth in these days. I know, and at the moment, we have a little 
a little bit of uh, tension in that uh, uh, system, but I think this is in the long run we have to we have to do things like basic, we have to do things like uh, uh, local uh, consumption, local production of, of food and, uh, and selling, yeah? and uh, zero. And I want to thank you, everybody, to listen to my word, for listening to my words. And maybe you have another question? No, we haven't got the time for that, but uh you see, we are, don't want to talk only about food, we want to talk about tourism, and, uh, but I think he's a proof that you can do the same thing, producing beef or something like that, producing tourism, and you can change it radically, the way how you do it. This was something you, I had to learn, and so therefore we are together on stage, huh? So, minus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gentlemen, it's great. Thank you so much. So I'm, I'm curious now. I mean, of course, you've just said that I've been working on this as well. So it's not all new to me. But I'm curious to see what will be coming out of this. I think you are curious because this was an introduction to say, OK, there is something radical. Maybe we're not drastic enough. So what, what will be? And this is going to be the next speakers. But let's give a good round of applause. Stefan Gerhardt. Thank you. Georg Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So here's what's going to happen next. We will have a presentation of 10 ideas, thesis, if you will, uh, on those radical changes. And of course, there's a certain level of radicalness to all of them. Some of them are perhaps not very radical. Maybe they're more incremental, and some of them are very radical. Are they possible? Are they feasible? This is all up for discussion. But in order to present those, I welcome Professor, it's a colleague of mine, Professor Burkhardt von Freiberg from the Munich uh, University of Applied Sciences. Burkhardt, come up to the, come up to the stage. Yeah. Just leave you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I now have the privilege of briefly presenting our 10 theses on which we have worked very extensively yeah, over the past six months. Are we drastic enough? So first thesis. Radical regulation of travel with a distance duration ratio. In 2023, according to UNWTO, international tourism arrivals reached 88% of 2019 levels and should be back to pre-COVID levels by the end of 2024. A good news, but also a lesson to be learned. We cannot go back to our old pre-COVID ways of traveling. Our first thesis is to call for radical regulation because it could be the answer to the industry's three main challenges. Enforcing a distance to duration ratio on flights, allowing to reduce carbon intensity of a trip, spend longer at destinations and encourage slow travel. Radically restricting some growth. Modeling shows that to keep within Paris Glasgow 1.5 C limit, 3,000 billion gallons of dirty jet fuel between now and 2050 can only be burned. At 2050, and only with significant investment, we can wean aviation of fossil fuels onto synthetic e-fuels and battery power. This thesis calls for the limitation of the availability of dirty jet fuel to this limit or the number of air miles flown as we must, and deals with the questions like, how would we distribute the dirty fuel, air miles fairly, and how cost and, how would be, and uh, what would it mean for cost of flying, who flies, where they fly, and for what purpose? How would it shape people's travel and tourism choices and industry product development? Yeah, very radical. Close of destinations. Challenging the widely accepted perspective of continuous tourism growth, 
This thesis puts to forward a contentious but potentially impactful approach to sustainable tourism. Implementing systematic and temporary shutdowns of touristic destinations for re regeneration and advocating for cessation of tourism development in a few pristine ecosystems while ensuring fair compensation for impacted local tourism operators. Full data transparency across all industry verticals and horizontals. Tourism businesses, including hotels, airlines, restaurants, and tour operators, proactively partake in data transparency initiatives across all industry verticals and horizontals. This collective effort aims to establish and maintain benchmarks in energy efficiency, waste reduction, and water conservation. Fair share of profit for sustainability. To actively participate in the UN decade of ecosystem restoration, this thesis challenges the traditional role of tourism firms by proposing a model where tourism service providers divert a defined proportion of their profits or revenues towards fighting deforestation and actively investing in the restoration of degraded habitats, thus integrating conservation efforts into their business strategy. So, new pricing, the two cost model, contradicting the prevalent pricing models in the tourism industry that largely overlook the external costs such as environmental degradation, strain on local resources, and social disruption. This thesis pioneers a proposition to establish a comprehensive pricing model that internalizes these externalities, essentially encapsulating the true cost of tourism. So, make tourism great again, the power of good. This thesis is a strategy to focus on the power of positive. Footprint measurement remains re relevant for identifying and mitigating the industry's negative impacts. A stronger emphasis should be placed on accelerating handprints, the beneficial impacts of tourism business operations. This concept necessitates the development of precise metrics to evaluate handprints, identifying the ripple effects of positive actions in the sector. It is about maximizing good. Eight, sustainability, sustainable from the very beginning. The marginal abatement cost curve, MAC, is a paradigm shift in tourism hospitality investments. The MAC incorporates sustainability, carbon reduction in this case, as a crucial factor in decision-making. By employing the MAC, investments can be evaluated based on their carbon abatement value alongside traditional financial metrics, in this case, net present value of an investment. Profit maximization and carbon footprint reduction is the goal. Nine, low impact food only, zero waste. Contrary to the industry norm of serving mass-produced cheap food, this thesis advances a proposition where the sector reorient food offerings toward low-impact food items, prioritizing vegetables while diminishing the prominence of meat to side dish status. I like the most. Moreover, challenging the accepted industry norms around food costs, asking for an in-depth review and reassessment of standards, particularly around food waste. This proposed exploration reconsiders the generally accepted food cost standard of 30%. And last but not least, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. This thesis emphasizes the transformation, transformative sorry, potential of scaling seemingly small individual initiatives into a global movement. So this thesis underscores the need to identify, quantify, and globally scale these initiatives rallying collective action. So of all the small actions that can take place, what are the overall impact reduction achieved once implemented, implemented at scale? Thank you very much. <laughs>
Wow. Did you notice how many cameras were up taking pictures? <laughs> no, you didn't notice, no? Mm -hmm. So obviously there's some interest in some of those, and we'll be developing those in a minute. Thank you so much. Thank you. My colleague, Professor okay. Volker von Freiberg. Thank you. I want to make a notice of Slido. So we will be using Slido again for this session. And I know there will be questions. I'm expecting your questions. It's the last half an hour of ITV this year. So please bring in your question. I think we have the QR code up on the, on the stage. So now to talk about radical changes, but a bit more in depth. So obviously, these are 10 ideas that Volkart has presented. Um, we, we don't have the time to really take all of them apart, but we can pick out a couple, perhaps. And to do that, we will welcome to our stage uh, Isham Zazu. He's a consultant and former minister of tourism for Egypt. We will welcome Aurélie Sandler. She's co-CEO at Evaneos, and Graham Jackson, who is the head of strategic partnership at the Travel Foundation. Let's welcome our guest to the stage, please. Thank you, Willy. Oh, you like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So I, I think we have we have. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for being here. Uh, the last few, as I said, last half an hour, and you're still around, which is great. But in, but then again, we said that the whole day. You, there's no way else to go tonight. This party in Berlin. You stay in Berlin. And you leave only tomorrow. Let's start with you, uh, Aurélie. So Evaneos. In case you don't know, it's celebrating 15-year anniversary. You have a lot. You have a big, big delegation here at ITB. So you've been growing, and you've seen things change over 15 years. I would imagine we talk about planetary boundaries. 15 years ago, it looked different than it looks right now. Um, do you think we need more drastic changes? And if yes, which of those wonderful ideas from Bocart will you present today? Thank you, Willy. Hello, everyone. So definitely, we truly believe that the, we need radical changes and. I'm quite happy to dig a little bit the first thesis regarding uh, radical regulation through uh, duration distance ratio. Okay. And if you're okay, let's begin let's with a quick question. Uh, what do you think is the link in between the three uh, companies you see here? So Unilever, The Body Shop, Calvin Klein. That's a good question. Yeah. Should we ask that to the audience? Anyone has a wish to just voice? What's the link between those three companies? To help you, yes. uh, we can obviously say they operate in different industries, so it's not That's the okay. industry app. Yep. They sell different types of products and they target different types of customers. But they do have something in common, which is that they, all in their industries, uh, took decisive actions in order to challenge the statu quo and bring positive changes. And if we take Calvin Klein, for instance, uh, as an example, Calvin Klein was, maybe you don't know that because we always talk a lot about Stella McCartney, but uh, Calvin Klein was the first brand to decide to ban fur from their collections, and that was three, deca 30 decades, three decades ago. Mm. Uh, and they were the first one to do that uh, by self-regulation, so they decided to do so. And uh, as you know, after that, uh, major brands in the fashion industry followed, and now more than 25 countries, I think, around the world decided to ban fur farming. So Calvin Klein was a pioneer inside this uh, fashion industry into deciding to stop something that was challenging, uh, positive impact, of course, and decided by self-regulation uh, to change the statu quo and then to foster uh, policy shifts. So you may wonder uh, what is the relevance for us. Well, uh, as uh, Burkhardt said a little bit earlier, if we delve a little bit into context, we know that uh, international tourist arrivals in 2023 are now reaching almost the levels of uh, 2019. At the end of the year, it should be the case. Uh, so that's good news for our business, but definitely we cannot go back to the pre-COVID ways of traveling, to the travel norms that were uh, at this time, because they are not sustainable. And why they are not sustainable? Uh, first, over tourism. You must know that 95% of tourists uh, are gathered in 5% of the planet. Second, uh, social injustice. Uh, 50 to 70% of tourism revenues uh, don't benefit to local 
destinations. They don't stay in local destinations because of tourism revenue leakage. And third, and it may be the major challenge for tourism actors and for our industry, um, tourism is responsible for 8% of the global carbon emissions uh, in, in 2019, and tourism should double by 2050. So you can imagine if we do nothing, what's going to happen. So what can we do? Mm -hmm. And that's when it comes radical. You may know André Gide, who is a, a French a famous writer, who said, choisir c'est renoncer. Uh, to choose is to give up. So, uh, in light of the stake, we truly believe that uh, our focus should not be only on developing new offer, more sustainable offer, but really radically think of what we need to stop, uh, which offer that cause harm that we would need to stop. And this is when it comes to our uh, proposition uh, and this thesis that were just presented before, uh, we truly believe that we need to regulate travel by linking the time you spent at destination with the length of the flight. Uh, how can we do that? Uh, thanks to data as we got from our uh, partner uh, Option Way, uh, we can link today the time spent at destination with the uh, length of the flight. So here you can see, for instance, that for a short haul flight, less than three hours, uh, the median uh, stay uh, at destination is five days, meaning half people stay less, half people stay more. And our proposition is to define <coughs> minimum requirements uh, for uh, your stay at destination, uh, depending on the length of your flight. So, for instance, if you travel long haul, uh, the minimum requirement for a stay at destination would be 15 days, two weeks. If you travel short haul, less than three hours, you would stay five days. So what do you do if you just have a weekend? Well, you choose an alternative uh, mode of transportation with lower carbon emissions, such as trains. And as a return of experience, we decided at Evaneos uh, to put that into place, so we decided to stop selling uh, city breaks that are accessible only by plane, so less than five days. And uh, we decided also to offer opportunities, alternatives uh, of city breaks accessible by train. So stopping by plane, accessible by train. And we got very positive feedback uh, from travelers, but also from the press, because it showed a, a genuine commitment for chains choosing to give up and not just to add something. Mm. And not only we believe that uh, it won't prevent travelers from traveling, uh, but that it can create opportunities, opportunity to visit closer to home destinations, opportunity also uh, to stay longer at destination. So, is it radical enough? Uh, is it feasible enough? And does it answer uh, the challenges we just uh, opened regarding carbon emission, over tourism, and social injustice? Uh, we believe it does, because if you stay longer at destination, uh, basically you will uh, split the carbon uh, emissions from the flight on more days. So you will mechanically uh, reduce the carbon intensity per day. Uh, moreover, uh, as we all have limited days off, if you travel longer, if you stay longer at destination, then you will travel less often, so hence less flights. Regarding uh, over tourism and the concentration of tourist flows, uh, what is very interesting, of course, is that if you stay longer in destination, you will be able to go off the beaten path and not stay only in the hotspots, overcrowded hotspots, where you have all the tourists. So you will explore the destination, and then it will enable uh, spread better the tourist flows. And last point, which is obvious, if you stay longer, you will spend more at destination. And as long as you choose local-owned businesses, which we highly encourage you to do, such as local accommodation, local activities, then the money you spend, you will spend more uh, that will stay in the local destination. So uh, this is how uh, we can leverage uh, this idea. And the question regarding feasibility is key, of course, how can we put that in place? There are three levels of feasibility. The first one, as we saw with the Calvin Klein example, is uh, to uh, decide by self-regulation to put that into place. So we can, as a company, decide to do it. The limit is, of course, that if just one company does that, the, lim the, the impacts will be small. And moreover, you can fear to lose your competitive edge uh, compared to your peers. So uh, I am here today, and we are here today, to encourage a global, more global uh, initiatives from uh, the 
um, actors of the industry a collective actions in order to bring by charter uh, or by code of conduct a collective uh, decisive action mm. in order to foster a better a future for tourism. So we truly believe, and that's why it's radical, but it needs to be there, that uh, it's only through a regulative framework uh, that we can uh, not only uh, push positive actions, but also set new standards uh, in the industry, establish new standards, uh, and then foster a better future for tourism. This is great. So this was a presentation of one of the thesis in more details. I'd like to turn to Graham, and Graham, I'm going to give you also the clicker, if you can just pass this around. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, please. Please, of course. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Aurélie. Graham, Graham, I think from your standpoint and also the Travel Foundation, tourism isn't moving fast enough on many fronts, if I'm correct. Um, what do you have in stock for us? Well, that's right, really. Um, <coughs> tourism is, is nowhere near moving fast enough. We, we know that um, as we see the, the numbers climbing back up and, we, and the, the growth trajectory <coughs> of the industry. So I'm going to be picking, I think it was the second uh, thesis, which is all around growth um, and, and how we grow the industry. Obviously, we've been at a big show, uh, tens of thousands of people walking through the doors, having meetings, uh, growing and growing the industry even more, but we do need a, a bit of a pause here um, to just take a rest and, and, and maybe um, uh, sober ourselves a, a little bit and just think about what sort of growth we can have in line with a net zero future. So I want you to just imagine for a minute a glass. You don't have to imagine it, there's one on the screen. Um, now, this glass holds the possibilities of limitless skies and boundless exploration. Now, is that glass half empty or half full? And this is a question you know, we might ask ourselves. And, and really, I think it encapsulates the duality that tourism faces today. So if we look at the glass being half empty, that brings to light the stark reality that we face as an industry. Um, the modeling's pretty clear. Uh, we, in, in order to stay within the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit set by the Paris Agreement and the Glasgow Declaration, our capacity for burning the dirty jet fuels is limited just to 3,000 billion gallons between now and 2050. And you can see here from this slide what's projected, uh, what, uh, what sort of uh, the projections are for um, uh, those dirty fuels um, uh, at our current growth trajectory. So this is a finite amount, but it's also a finite opportunity. And it forces us to confront quite a daunting question, I think, as an industry. Can we sustain our soaring aspirations without destroying the destinations and the communities we depend on. So that's the glass half empty. But if we look at it as a half, from the half full perspective, we stand at the precipice of transformation. We have a chance to redefine our industry and chart a course towards a more sustainable future. So this glass, though constrained, holds the potential for innovation, for us to reimagine how we do tourism and continue on a growth trajectory without growing our emissions at the same time. So as we contemplate this glass, whether it's halfway full or halfway depleted, uh, halfway, halfway depleted or filled with potential, we, let's have a look at some of the possibilities that lie ahead of us. The choices we make now, today, will shape our trajectory in tourism, and they'll determine whether indeed our skies remain limitless or become constrained by the consequences of our inaction as an industry. <clears throat> the glass really forces us to consider how we distribute these limited resources fairly. Who gets the dirty fuel? Who gets the hands on those new in-demand technologies, the cleaner synthetic fuels? It raises questions about equity and access. These are all really serious considerations as we navigate the path ahead, because it's very clear that not all emissions are equal. So let's talk about the potential consequences. What would this mean for the cost of flying, for example, who gets to fly, where they get to fly, the very fabric of our travel and tourism industry would undergo a profound transformation. Now, it's not just about restrictions, it's about reshaping the entire landscape of our industry, how we do business, how we set our growth goals. These are all things that we need to be, consider. And to address these challenges, several interventions could be considered. So the first would be to potentially bring in uh, international aviation emissions under destination national carbon budgets. So that would effectively shift the power and agency to destinations 
and move it away from a demand-led economy towards a supply-led one that optimizes the benefits from its emissions budget. So really deciding which planes do we want to come here, who's on them, uh, and are we prepared to accept that type of tourism in our destination? Another strategy could be implementing a policy to limit the supplies of jet fuels, um, airport slots, and the total distance flown. If we did this proactive approach, that would put a cap on our environmental impact while pushing our industry towards cleaner, sustainable alternatives. We could look at a frequent flying levy, for example, or a true tax on aviation fuels as another viable option. By creating a fi financial incentive to limit air travel or for people to travel less often, we can restrict demand and generate funds at the same time for those crucial investments that we need as an industry to move towards those cleaner, greener technologies. Furthermore, we could consider a poten the potential benefits of a cap on long-haul flights. Um, a regional or global moratorium on long-haul growth could allow more people to fly for shorter distances. So imagine, if you will, how destinations uh, group together to market themselves, you know, visit Europe. Um, well, if we decided amongst those countries that you know, we're only going to grow long-haul flights at a certain rate or we're going to not stop advertising to long-haul markets and focus instead on nearer markets, it would have a profound uh, change. So I'm just going to conclude now by saying in order to actually hit those net zero targets, and you, you'll see from the graphs earlier, we're, we're way off as an industry, we need to recognize that all growth isn't equal. And this really necessitates a paradigm shift. We need to rethink our strategies, and we need to reimagine our industry and collectively work towards a brighter future. Um, this, uh, a lot of these stats that I've used today are from our report um, that we did with our friends there on the right-hand side of, your, uh, of the screen, uh, Envisioning Tourism in 2030 and Beyond. Um, you can get that report from our website. I encourage you to have a look at it, and, and it goes into a lot more detail. And, and while the ideas I presented today are potentially quite radical, there's also lots of things that we can do that are much easier um, to implement. So there are lots of tips and advice in there and guidance for, for operators, um, for uh, accommodation providers, for destinations. Um, and so if you're looking for somewhere to start on this journey uh, and you don't want it to be this radical, um, then we need to all get radical. Oh, look at that Thank one. You. And that's Graham for thesis number two. Thanks very much, Graham, for this. A round of applause, please. <clears throat> And of course, Isham, you've been sitting and you've been listening to those two propositions, and those two propositions actually look very much at the world of restricting, in some ways, right, or aligning better to the planetary boundaries. But I wonder what your thoughts are from the receiving end, actually, from the right, from well, the uh, I will. Because, because what are the consequences, and what must we, what are the blind spots that we should not ignore? From the social perspective, perhaps at the destinations, can you ex expand a little bit on what would that mean for you? Thank you, Uli, for getting this subject up, because I was worried. We're moving into that r radical change path very fast between Orly and my, uh, my friend here, both left and Graham on my left-hand side. I think I'm part of that group. I'm part of that vision, definitely. But what you're saying is very important. There is a social dimension, and there is a social component for tourism. Tourism, as we say, is one of the tools for poverty eradication. For some countries, like my country, Egypt, uh, we need tourism. We need people coming and spending money. And let me please propose just for one minute to tell you a short story. Back when I was a minister in 2012, I was in Luxor and we had this Arab Spring movement at the time. Nobody wants to come over to the destination, Egypt. And Luxor, a very famous city we have in Egypt, was deserted. I was coming out of this governmental building, and there, there was this Kalesh owner and the horse and a, a kid. And the guy goes, the Kalesh owner there, said, Mr. Minister, Mr. Minister, please, I would like uh, to talk to you just for a second. And I said, yes, yes, how can I help you? He said, sir, there is no tourist, there is no business coming. The city is deserted, do something. I said, sure, I'm trying. He said, by the way, I have come to a point that with the little money that I have today, would I feed that horse in front of you or my boy? I took a decision then as a government to help both. But he told me, tourists, when they come, they do have a social dimension and welfare for underprivileged societies. So my take on that for you and for 
people listening to us here today and watching us, while we are taking drastic decisions which should be taken, always put the social dimension into your decisions. So cutting on long haul or on medium or short haul is one thing, but getting people to a destination, staying longer will help in that case, or Lee, as you mentioned. So, but the social dimension is very important. And you mentioned that people come in package tours, they don't really benefit the societies. So that social dimension should be addressed while looking into the various thesis in that sense. From one to 10, put the social dimension into perspective. And thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think this is, yeah. Well deserved. Well deserved, thank you so much. Uh, and I think this is something that we have to keep in mind, actually, when we design, and we've talked a lot about this, we've talked about climate and social justice, intergenerational justice, we've done all that, and I think this is very good because you keep us a little bit on check with all of this. We're coming out to an end, and I have to, I have to wrap up, actually, yeah. uh, all of this. I'd like to ask you, actually, one last question, is um, if you have something radical in the plans for you this year, I mean, even perhaps privately, do you have something planned that you say, I don't know, I'm doing X, Y, Z, and that's for me radical. Do you want to share something? If you have something, really? Let me think a little bit, okay. Hisham. Well, I have to think, but I think people are coming more and more to my country to visit those sites, the temples and the tombs, and the carrying capacity is worrying me in that sense. So how to distribute it is my take on that. Very good. Yeah. Graham? I'd just like to say how, how much I agree with the social justice angle, and I think that you know, in, this, in these discussions, we really need to make sure that those that need and deserve tourism are prioritized, and also those, um, those places that are being most affected by the impacts of climate are also prioritized at the same time. So if we are going to cap, then we need to think, how do we cap? And exactly, we those and this is going to be very important. Yeah. Already, you have the last word. Yeah. yeah, and I fully agree also with the social uh, impact of tourism and all the benefits and amongst even all these benefits just the power of travel to have travel dream and share and cross boundaries and fostering peace also so definitely let's be radical but let's not forget why we are all working in this industry yeah. loving it and sharing a passion and Graham okay. yeah, one last thing just, just one final thing so on the on the subject of climate justice that's uh, our next report uh, will be on that it'll be coming out in the next couple of do months do check it out so look out for that yeah, do check it out please a big round of applause to our panelists uh, Aurélie thank Isham, you, really. and Graham please thank you thank you so much thank you and do stick around for two more minutes as we do a quick wrap up I'd like to yeah I'd like to welcome KT. I'm not supposed to talk when the music is going on. Yes. Let's go. Okay, okay. Oh, it's good to be on stage with you guys. I know. Katie I and Millie. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? What a day, hey? Yeah. What a day. What a day for the audience, Thank really. You so I think, much. I think Thank I'd like to. Thank you for still to, being yeah. here with being us. Here with yeah. us. It just uh, goes to you, and of course, to you joining us virtually. Uh, thank you so much for being around and yeah, for being here with us on the, on the orange stage at the ITB convention when we talk about the future travel track and responsibility track because sustainability really has to do something with how we travel in future, right? And I'd like to sit down with you and have a look, um, a little flashback, what echoes, what is still in the air. No. that you've debated and maybe that's also in your thoughts. Join with us the conversation at the ITB convention um, with the hashtag ITB2024 online on the social media channels. We are so thrilled to read your thoughts and your questions. But nevertheless, Xenia, what is still on your mind? And then, uh, Willy, what is actually still echoing you from bet. the day? I'm ready. In your mind. I let's <laughs> let's see if Willy and I are uh, aligned. Yeah. Go ahead. Xenia, would you start? I think... Um, various topics that have sort of stuck with me, I think, is the issue around collaboration. When it comes to climate change, when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to regenerative biodiversity, we cannot go at it alone. That has just come throughout the last two days. But that's not a new thing, is it? I mean, it, we've it is made it more. also last year. Yeah, but uh, it's even more, it's becoming more of a of course we're going to work together. Before it was like, yeah, we have to work together, let's find ways. And now it's like, we're working together, it's happening. 
it's happening and we know that even to overcome even more challenges it has got to be collaborative and it's got to there's got to be a co cooperation and then i think the other thing that was very exciting for both Willie and i is the, the the thing that nature and biodiversity was center stage of our conversations and i think um eric actually brought it back to the point this morning from Bremio in the point in the sense being why did we get into this in the first place certainly from my perspective why did i get into travel and and tourism and sustainability because I love nature and I love learning about other cultures and and let's get back to the basics of that what does that mean if I want to be able to if we want to be able to continue to deliver that within travel and tourism we have got to think of regenerative radical rethinking of that really before I come to you what took us away from this profound thought of the beginning from the baseline I think, you know, the, the fact that climate change is so obvious and that temperature change is so obvious that everybody focused on primarily on CO2 emissions and we got slightly distracted, but a need, you know, necessary distraction was to address carbon. But I think the mistake was to separate climate from nature. To me, climate and nature is the same thing. You cannot separate them. And I don't know where the conversation separated at some point when it was, I think when it started talking about 1.5, which we needed a goal, but then everything was about how do we reduce our emissions? And not that 1.5 is also about healthy ecosystems. And I think that's really coming together now. And, and, and that to me is exciting because natural assets are tourism assets. Thank you, Xenia. Really? I'll keep it super short. I mean, I think, I think none of us have gotten to this because of a carbon story. Do you know what I mean? The carbon <laughs> is just an, an add-on. But if you ask hardcore sustainability people, what do you get into this? Oh, it's because of the carbon. No, it isn't about the carbon. But we do have a carbon tunnel vision, I think, heavily. Um, and we said that last year. I said that like, a good decarbonization plan that's too late is a bad decarbonization plan. I sort of feel like we moved on a little bit to that. It's very important, but I think we got it. Except scope three emissions that are very hard. I think scope one and two, we shouldn't even be discussing about it. That should be in the hands. And so let's move on to, to nature climate solution. Let's have a look at nature-based solution. Let's have a look at everything around this, everything in the complexity of biodiversity because it's at the core of everything. And I think this is what we tried to do at ITB this today, in fact. We really tried to bring this this morning and you know, flowing throughout the afternoon a little bit as well, um, the value of, of nature, actually. So let's go and get out there and go into get a deep breath of fresh air soon out of this hall. Maybe in Estonia, <laughs> where there is the freshest in Estonia, air in right. the world. As we're fresh. No, but what, and, and, what, and what is amazing as well is, uh, I mean, there's a lot of very sad story, but there's also uh, some exciting story, I think, on that aspect, especially, and we didn't have this year the designers and the architects, and perhaps we'll do that next time, to bring them on board and to see how much is happening on that front in terms of biophilic design and bringing nature back into our buildings. Bringing, and this is absolutely fascinating, and I think it fits quite well with the biodiversity narrative. So who's missing? That's a very interesting question, because we tend to really stay sometimes with the conversations within our bubbles, right? So who's missing? And who would well, be I mean, an interesting guest for the ITB 2025? There's, there's a whole bunch of guests, but we have to be careful to be able to give the voice to many, right? And yes. we, we, I mean, I, I'd like to have some more of the real estate people, but this is more for hospitality. We have to see the world of the world of tourism is not only hospitality, but we should have the discussion around the building. We talk about urban environment, and we talk about nature, which is very good, but let's face it, half of our world population will be in cities. And so urban, urban environment, and greening that urban environment, and what's the role of tourism there? And I think we have a massive opportunity there to do good work. So that would be a group of people I'd like to have, the real estate, the architect, the designers on one side, here to talk to us about this. It's been something I've been wanting to do. I just didn't have a chance to do it this year, but maybe next year. But also another thing is we also talked about technology here on stage, and that was already yesterday a big topic. Artificial intelligence is one of the biggest buzzwords yeah. at this year's ITB. But I'd like to hear from you. What is the connection between technology and sustainable travel and tourism? And how do we have to think these buzzwords also together when we talk about cooperation? Clinia? Well, I think technology obviously allows us to have the data, it allows us to have the transparency, it allows us to do the report reporting, but we also have to be aware, and this is something that we're doing at the Sustainable Markets Initiative, that data comes from space, right? Space is where the satellite sits. We have no regulations out there yet. It's a, it's a voluntary agreement. We have more space pollution than we have ocean pollution, and yet we're dependent on that technology. So I think if you ask me who I'd like here next year, I'd like some people that are going to talk to us about 
Where are we getting our data from? Where are we getting our technology from? And what is space, you know, space tourism is something that's starting to be discussed. Is that, is that insane? Is it healthy? Should we do it? And then we have, we have space mining for materials. So I think there's, there's another dimension if we want to think about the future. Um, so that's where technology comes from. It's really important. We really need it. We need it for projections. We need it for transparent, transparency. But it also comes with pitfalls that we have to be aware of. Willi, we also had the topics of gender equality and building up connections with the Studiosos talk here on stage. Yes. Why did you decide to curate these topics also for the responsibility and sustainability tourism track? Simply because the focus we have on the environment is very good, there's no doubt about it, but we're not going to fix anything on the environment if we don't have the very base of society and equality and, and inclusiveness and so on. If, if people are not feeling that they're part of this, they're simply not going to take care of the environment. It's very difficult. And so you need to, this is super important actually. And so, and I come from the environmental side and I, 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 I'm a passionate at the environment. But, I've got but why is it so often then forgotten, the social side? Because, because it's tricky, right? I mean, every time we have a discussion around this, the, there, and there are topics that it, it's hard to approach. I mean, we, I think Nicole here on the stage was talking about this, in, in particularly in harassment and so on. There are topics that are, they're, they're not comfortable. It's discomfort, and we have a hard time to deal with this, actually. And I want to write a book on the art of discomfort and how we should embrace discomfort as us growing right out of our comfort. I think it's so important. I think that panel actually talked about that. And I think this is it. I mean, the social component gives us, it's a reflection on us as a society, and that reflection is not always nice. We don't like to see it. It's hard. The environment is a little bit more... The environment doesn't have a voice. I mean, we're the voice for the environment, and so it's perhaps easier to deal, even though we have a hard time dealing with it. Social, always a bit tougher. Well, the social fabric needs to be included. That's what yeah. I definitely learned uh -huh. today. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Thank we, I, you. Can we please say thank you to yes. Cathy Gallo's place? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. ITP and, Anchor Star. And, and if I can have the mic, please, if I can have the mic one more time, can you hear me? I, I'd, also, I'd also maybe we turn our heads to all these tech people. Yes, I know you probably were going to say scenes. something. Nothing would be possible without yes. you guys. And it's Peter, and it's the camera people, and they're all super, super amazing. Thank you so much for this amazing work. Absolutely. Behind the scenes, there's a whole crew, because, you know, they don't get the spotlight as we That's get right. here on the stage. So this goes out to you guys. Yes, it's good out to you. So and to you our audience, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Yep. All right, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, we're going to stay a little bit around maybe for a drink because we cannot leave anyway, Berlin, but hey, that's, right. that's it's another a story. <laughs> it's a wrap. Do we see each other at ITB 2025? I hope so. As Absolutely. Risham would say, and I, inshallah. Yes, and you're here. You have to be back because there's more. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us here. Have a lovely time Thank uh, you. At, in Berlin. Enjoy your night. And I say see you next year. See you at the ITB. Thank you, family. Thank you. Bye.